Um, okay, well, I guess I'll get started. Um, um, maybe more people will come. If not, hopefully some people will watch this recording. Um, okay, so as usual, um, I'm gonna start by saying where we are in the book. So the doctrine of elements had two parts, the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. And the transcendental logic has two parts, the analytic of concepts, which we've now finished, and the analytic of principles. Oh, sorry. I left out a level of uh, transcendental logic has two parts, transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic. The transcendental analytic has two parts, the analytic of concepts, and the analytic of principles. And the analytic of principles has three parts, which is actually a little bit surprising. So the first part, which was most of the reading for today, is the schematism. I guess it's called the schematism of the pure concepts of the understanding. I don't remember what the full title is. Then there's the system of principles. So right, the reading for today was the, the, the introduction to the analytic of principles and the schematism and the introduction to the system of principles. Um, and then there's a third part. Well, so I'll just say, um, roughly speaking, this part, the schematism, is about what it means for the categories to apply to experience. We showed in the analytic of concepts that the categories must apply to experience. The schematism is supposed to say, okay, what does it mean for the categories to apply to experience? And then the system of principles is supposed to use that to um, establish certain synthetic a priori principles. Um, and uh, you might expect the analytic, the transcendental analytic to end there, right? Remember, the transcendental analytic is the positive part of the project here. So when, when we finish the system of principles, we've um, answered the question, how is synthetic a priori knowledge possible? In particular, how is synthetic a priori metaphysical knowledge possible? Because remember, we accounted for mathematical knowledge in the transcendental aesthetic. Um, um, not only have we answered the question, but we've actually given a list of the fundamental metaphysical synthetic a priori um, judgments, principles. So it's a little bit surprising that there's then a third part, which is called phenomena and noumena. Um, and when we get to that, I'll say something about why that's there. Kant begins by saying that, you know, um, in a sense, we've already finished what we're supposed to do, but <laughs> um, so, um, but for now, I'll just point out that that's coming. All right. Um, um, by the way, for, for those people who are here and for those who uh, are watching the recording, I want to apologize um, 
Number one, for the confusion about handing in the assignment. Um, and uh, I just uh, was out of contact due to the holiday when that all happened. So I, <laughs> um, uh, didn't deal with it until this morning um, and then didn't deal with it very well to begin with. But um, and I also want to apologize for yet again for the sudden change in venue of this course. I hope we'll be, be back um, uh, I hope we'll, we'll be back in person next week. I once again just uh, don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> um, um, okay, but anyway, back to Kant. Um, okay, so that's where we are overall. And now I'm gonna start talking about the analytical principles and how it works. Um, so, uh, so the, actually the, the heart, so to speak, of the analytic of principles comes, uh, towards the end of today's reading. It's in the, uh, introduction to the system of principles and it's called the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgments. Highest or supreme. Um, so what is the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgment? Well, uh, let's see. Here it is. <laughs> Oops, where's my... Even put a little box around it. Every object stands under the necessary conditions of synthetic unity of the manifold of intuition in a possible experience. Um, so I'm going to try to unfold what that means and what it has to do with the schematism that comes before it and the principles that are coming afterwards. Um, this should be compared with the highest principle of all analytic judgments. Um, Well, it's here, but I didn't know I did. Oh, it's right here at the beginning. Okay. The proposition, this is the highest principle of all analytic judgments. No predicate contradictory of a thing can belong to it. That's Kant's formulation of the principle of contradiction. Principle of contradiction. Right? There's different ways of stating the principle of contradiction. Um, so uh, um, the oh, sorry, I was writing on the board. There you go. Highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgment, highest principle of all analytic judgments is the principle of contradiction. Um, the, uh, um, I mean, 
We nowadays would tend to state the principle of contradiction in terms of propositions or judgments, right? We would say like not P and not P, right? That's a formulation of the principle of contradiction. It says that a proposition and its negation are not both true. Um, but the way Kant is stating it is more similar to the way Aristotle states it, although he, with an important difference. Um, he's, he's stating the pr principle of contradiction in terms of predicates that can attach to something. And Ray, again, the statement is no predicate contradictory of a thing can belong to it, meaning um, like If the thing is A, then it isn't not A. Um, so you see that this way, it's fundamentally a condition on concepts. And then gets... Um, spread to judgments or propositions, right? That is, if A is contained in my concept of the thing, I can't attribute not A to it. And so therefore, in particular, the judgment, something A is not A, is um, necessarily false. Um, So, um, in a sense, both of these principles are principles of all judgments, according to Kant. They're principles of all judgments in their negative use. Right? So, in the case of this one, the highest principle of analytic judgments, it's a principle of all judgments. It's a negative principle of all judgments whatsoever. Um, right? It says a judgment is no good if it violates this principle. If it, maybe you should even say if it attempts to violate this principle, right? Because this is, I, and again, this is where it's important to understand what Kant means by form here. This is a formal, this is a principle of formal logic, meaning it has to do with the intrinsic nature of the judgment as a mode of a thinking thing in abstraction from the fact that it refers to an object, that it's a judgment about something. And um, and this, this, a judgment that violates this principle is formally invalid, meaning it doesn't really succeed in being a judgment. Right, so um, what Kant actually says is, um, that uh, judgments that violate this principle are quote unquote null and void. That's how Kemp Smith translated, if I remember correctly. Let's see right now. We'll see right now, but I think uh, Kemp Smith says they're null and void. What it actually says in the original is that a judgment that viola violates this is nothing. <laughs> right? Meaning, I think, like, it lacks formal reality. 
it isn't really doesn't succeed in being a judgment. Um, whereas this one is a negative principle for all judgments whatsoever that are not empty. That is, for all judgments that actually succeed in referring to an object. Um, so if they don't violate this principle, then they do succeed in being judgments. So Kant will say, we're thinking something when we entertain that judgment or when we assert it. But, um, but if they violate this principle, then although we're thinking something, we're, we haven't succeeded in thinking something about anything. <laughs> we haven't succeeded in referring, relating to an object of cognition or knowledge. Um, um, so that's the difference between these two. And again, again, like in that negative way, they're, they're principles for, let's say, all successful judgments. <laughs> I mean, I guess I probably shouldn't exactly say that because according to Kant, there is some use to those, some, those empty judgments sometimes. Um, uh, partly because what's empty from a theoretical point of view may become non-empty from a practical point of view, but even beyond that, maybe there's some use to them sometimes. Um, but uh, but uh, but the principal use of judgments is to know what's true of the objects of my cognition, and the judgments that violate this are, you know fail in that respect. So they're not really successful judgments. Okay, so um, so I just explained why these are both, in a sense, principles of all judgments. Um, why does he call this one the highest principle of all analytic judgments, and this one the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgments? Well, it's because each of them has a positive use, as well as the negative use. The positive use is a result of the negative use, um, but the positive use is limited. So like it's easiest to understand in this case, um, suppose I have a judgment, the negation of which is a contradiction. Right, like, so I have a judgment like, um, All bodies are extended. And we're assuming that body means an extended substance, right? So, um, so suppose we negate this judgment. So now we have um, not all bodies are extended or some bodies are not extended. Well, that contains a contradiction, right? Because it says some extended things are not extended. Some extended substances are not extended. That is, uh, maybe I shouldn't have erased Kant's formulation. It says of a thing, namely body, that it, it attaches a predicate to it that contradicts the concept of that thing. So it violates the principle of contradiction. So the negation of this judgment violates the principle of contradiction. Therefore, the judgment itself must be affirmed. Right? Because its negation is false. Its negation is certainly false because of this principle. And therefore, the judgment itself must be affirmed. Now, like most judgments you know, like all bodies are heavy. So all bodies are heavy. It doesn't contain a contradiction, nor does, according to Kant, does its negation contain a contradiction, right? So all bodies are heavy, like is allowed by this principle, 
but this principle doesn't help to establish it. It just says, oh, it's okay. It's, that doesn't contain a contradiction, right? So in a positive sense, this principle doesn't help establish most judgments. It only, but it does help, it does establish judgments whose negations contain a contradiction. And those are just the analytic judgments, as you can see from this example, right? An analytic judgment is one whose negation contains a contradiction because, um, and you know, think of the subject list predicate list version of judgments. And it'll be easiest to understand, right? Like an analytic judgment says S is P, where P is contained in the list of characteristics that, that makes up S. So obviously, if you negate this, you're going to get a contradiction, right? Because S, so to speak, equals P plus other stuff, right? So like in this case, body equal extended plus substance. This is a plus. This is like an alpha. I don't know why I chose alpha, but there it is. All right. So, right, and that what makes it analytic is that the predicate is already in the subject somewhere. So now, if we negate it, we're going to be saying that something that's P is not P, and that's a contradiction. So analytic judgments are just the judgments whose negations are contradictions, and therefore, this principle in its positive use is restricted to analytic judgments. That's why it's called the principle of all analytic judgments. And therefore this at least should be, so I think actually Kant usually just calls it the highest principle of all synthetic judgment. And, and, but um, that would be like asymmetrical with the one way he's named this one. So I'm putting, that's why I'm putting this in the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgments, right? So similarly, a synthetic a priori judgment is going to be a judgment whose negation doesn't imply a contradiction, at least not um, inside the judgment, but it contradicts the conditions of possibility for referring to an object. And since, again, since the negation of the judgment um, must be false, the judgment itself must be true. It's, it's the same procedure. And um, here, this is where Kant explains it's a little bit farther back in the book. Um, this is B84, and it's page 98 in Kemp's film. For although our knowledge may be in complete accordance with logical demands, that is, may not contradict itself, it is still possible that it may be in contradiction with its object. I don't know if that's really what I should be quoting. This perhaps includes a posteriori truth. Um, but um, but that's, that's the idea that something that, a, a judgment that violates this principle, the principle of all synthetic, the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgment, um, a judgment that violates it, rather than saying something, um, rather than saying of A that it is not A, it says of A, so to speak, sense of A that I can't refer to it. 
Now, of course, it doesn't say it outright, but it implies that somehow, right? And that must be false. Right, because I can't be talking about A at all if I can't refer to A. <laughs> so that can't be right. And so the negation of it is true. And like that right there is basically the answer to how is synthetic a priori metaphysical knowledge possible. It's possible because um, there's some things that although they're thinkable, they don't contain a contradiction. They contradict our ability to refer to an object. And right, I guess important piece here, and the transcendental deduction has shown that we can refer to an object. <laughs> we must be able to, right? So, um, right, so an example, um, so actually, maybe it says of A that I can't refer to A. Maybe that's not the right way to put it. It says that the conditions for my ability to refer to objects are um, missing. Right? So an example of this would be According to Kant, some event has no cause. So in the reading for next time of the second analogy, we'll see in detail Kant's explanation. Why so much detail is necessary is a good question, which I'm going to say whatever I can about next time. But in any case, we'll see in great detail Kant's explanation for why uh, I can't coherently to say that some events have no cause. That it, um, that although there's no contradiction in saying that an event has no cause, right? An event means um, uh, something changes state from one state to, an op to the opposite state. That's an event, right? A cause means there is something previous to that that determined it to happen. So in this case, determined it to happen, I guess, means like in determinism, fixed that it would happen. I'm, I'm really... I wish I had a better unified theory of all the ways Kant uses that word determine. <laughs> but in any case, right, so a cause means that there was something prior to the event that made it certain that the event would happen, that made it necessary. Yes, it's better than to say certain. Um, so there's no contradiction in saying that something changed from one state to another, but there was nothing prior to that in time that made it necessary for that change. But Kant says um, um, that uh, we can't represent something, we can't refer to something as an event unless we suppose that it does have a cause. So when we say some event has no cause, we're saying something that though it's not self-contradictory, it contradicts the possibility of us talking about events. And so it must be wrong. And so the, the negation of this, namely every event has a cause, um, must be true. And that's a synthetic a priori principle. It's a priori because it's certainly true and we don't have to consult experience to find out if it's true on the contrary as Kant says it's all right experience is only possible because this is true right because remember he's he's claiming that we can't so much as uh cognize an event 
We can't so much as refer to an event unless we assume it has a cause. So it's only because every event has a cause that there is that there are events, <laughs> that there is experience, right? So we couldn't we couldn't have learned from experience. I mean, this is I think is really just uh, um, more focused version of Hume's original argument here, and I think is supposed to be. Right. why we couldn't have learned this principle from experience. But be that as it may, anyway, so Kant is saying, it's so it's a priori, but it's not analytic, because if we're analytic, then it's, right, that is this. This a priori principle is not analytic, because if we're analytic, then its negation would be a contradiction. And we just said that this is not a contradiction. So its negation is certainly false, but not formally invalid. And that's why it's a synthetic a priori principle. Notice, by the way, that this is a really important example because if you look at this a certain way, it might seem to be a statement of the possibility of freedom. Right, there's an event that didn't have a prior cause. This is an origin of um, experience that's not predetermined by anything else. So um, uh, when when we get to the transcendental dialectic, we'll see Kant trying to explain how um, how actually important it is, I think, for practical philosophy itself that um, freedom doesn't consist of this kind of uncaused event. In fact, a free cause is a cause that would, a free cause would be a non-temporal cause, so it wouldn't have any events in it. Right? An event, again, is a change of state between one time and another. So events are in time. That is, they're objects of inner sense. That is, they're phenomena or things that happen to phenomena. Um, uh, okay, but like I said, that's what we'll get to later. Um, are, there, are there any questions about this so far? Now I'm going to get back to the, I guess, the details of what's actually in the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgment. I guess, you know, um, I can add one more thing. All of this is only true for an intellect like ours, a, a discursive intellect. An intuitive intellect would have a positive, necessary, and sufficient condition of truth in itself, right? It would have a principle of its own nature from which the truth of, of all true judgments follows. <laughs> um, um, so... Right. Unlike us, we can only rule out certain truths because they violate some principle. That's all we can do a priori. But the intuitive intellect would actually be able to derive all truths from its own nature a priori. And therefore, um, it, it wouldn't use these principles. Including the principle of contradiction wouldn't be wouldn't be relevant to it. Um, now, you know, uh, how would that work? What kind of principle would it have? Kant says, we have no idea. We don't even know if this is possible. <laughs> but it's thinkable, right? It's thinkable because we can take the um, a description of a discursive intellect and just leave part of it out. <laughs> um, but as soon as we leave that part out, we're 
no longer sure we're thinking about anything. Okay. All right. So uh, now back to the um, to the highest principle of all synthetic a priori judgment. Um, again, this is on B one ninety seven. Page 194 in Kemp Smith. Every object stands, on, stands under the necessary conditions of synthetic unity of the manifold of intuition in a possible experience. So synthetic unity, remember, is what the understanding supplies. Right? The intuition supplies what is manifold in cognition. Synthetic unity is supplied by the understanding. Um, so in between is what the imagination does, namely synthesis. So the principle here says that um, um, the manifold of intuition in a possible experience, and again, that means like the manifoldness, what is manifold in intuition um, in a possible experience is... Um, necessarily meets the conditions for synthetic unity. It must be possible for the understanding to represent it using a concept. And if that's true, then um, if it's true that the manifold of intuition meets the conditions for synthetic unity, then it must be because a certain synthesis of the imagination is possible, right? So here we have manifold and intuition. And here we have the synthetic unity of the understanding. Synthetic unity, sometimes kind of calls it unity of synthesis. This is the understanding that is the intellect. And we're saying that this meets the condition for the possibility of this. Well, the only way this can unify this is if the imagination first puts it together, that is, synthesizes it. So in between, is this synthesis of the imagination. So like when we figure out what it means in detail, that this synthetic unity is always possible, it's gonna go by way of figuring out what the, what the imagination must be able to do with the manifold in and to begin with with the manifold in inner sense that is in time right so i mean you can you can sort of see that here right what we're talking about here is like how it must be possible to associate sensations that come at different times. That, like, the faculty that does that is the imagination. But it does it, again, as I was saying last time, it does it for the purposes of the understanding. It does it in order to make unification by a concept possible. And, um, 
you know, what we have here is, in this case, the concept is the category of cause and effect, the second moment or the second moment of the category of relation. Um, where uh, the highest principle means, among other things, that it must be possible to use that category to represent the manifold in inner sense, the manifold in time. And this thing about changes from one state to another having before them something else that makes it necessary for them to happen is like a statement about what the imagination must be able to do with this manifold. Right? So the overall plan of the analytic of principles um, or at least of the first two parts, because as I said, the third part's kind of unexpected. The overall plan is that, first of all, in the schematism, we list the kinds of synthesis of the imagination that correspond to each of the categories. And they're all going to be, um, so when we say kinds of synthesis, I mean, they're going to be ways of associating some manifold in inner sense. But all we know about the manifold is that it's in inner sense, right? We don't know like what sensations are in it. We don't know anything about what sensations there are except a posteriori. <laughs> so, um, so these kinds of synthesis are going to be. Um, ways of putting together anything that occurs in, in time <laughs> without knowing what it is, <laughs> right? Any kind of effect on our intuition that occurs in time. So again, you, you see that here, right? Like we, an event is, is defined completely abstractly. Something changes from one state to an opposite state. Um, okay, so that's what that's the schematism. And then um, the highest principle says, okay, you have to be able to do all those kinds of synthesis. <laughs> and then the system of principles, at least this is what we expect, then just says, okay, so um, we have to be able to do this kind of synthesis, this kind of, right, go down the list of categories. And it does go down the list of categories. Um, the only thing is that you might expect it to be much shorter than it is. You might expect it to be short the way the schematism is. Right, the schematism just says, okay, take this category. This is the kind of synthesis we need. Take this category. This is the kind of synthesis we need. And it's over in a few pages. But the analytic of principles, instead of then saying, okay, so this kind makes this principle necessary and this kind makes this principle necessary, contains these huge long proofs, as we'll see. I mean, we're not going to read most of the analytic of principles because it's so long. Um, this is where we're going to start skipping around in the book. But uh, but just the second analogy, which is the proof of this, um, goes on for pages and pages. I mean, it's not all the proof. A lot of it is side remarks and whatever. But still, the proof itself is pretty is pretty involved. So I'll have to try to explain what's going on there. Why it's not? It seems like it should be just one principle that we're applying over and over, and it could just kind of be mechanical, but it turns out not to be. All right. Um, okay, so we're asking um, in, the, in the schematism leading up to the highest principle, we're asking um, what does it take to apply What does it mean to apply 
a given category um, to experience. Sure, that's exactly the right word to write there. Um, anyway, to um, what does it take to what does it mean to apply it? And uh, I guess let me erase most of this. So, um, um, so the faculty of applying concepts is called the faculty of judgment. Yeah, I mean, this is something that's a little bit hard to represent in translation. So in German, the word for judgment is urteil. Um, this is actually, this is an interesting word. This this looks like it divides into tile, which means like division or like parts. And ur, which means like original something like that so like hegel and heidegger and a bunch of people go to town with that it's that's actually not the right etymology <laughs> um this is it doesn't mean original part or original division this is actually a cognate of the english word ordeal um it's it comes in here through a judicial metaphor a judgment is like a, a dealing out of um, shares, right? Like a fair dealing out of shares to everyone. That's what ordeal used to mean in English too. Then because they started determining what was everyone's fair share by having them hold on to a hot piece of metal or whatever, it came to mean what it means now. All right, anyway, that's just... <laughs> Well, irrelevant etymology. Um, but there's this other word, Urtaus Kraft, right? The power of judgment, power of judgment. So this is what I'm translating here as the faculty of judgment. Um, I mean, Pretty often in English, we call them both judgments. Right, we call it the faculty of judgment, judgment. <laughs> and what it does also judgment, just like with intuition. Um, and I mean, Kant does that with intuition in German, but with judgment, he, he makes this distinction. Okay, I, is that important? I mean, It is important because the faculty of judgment that, I mean, the, I, I guess, yeah, this, this is why actually maybe he does this with judgment and not with intuition. The, the acts of the faculty of judgment are not necessarily judgments. Although the faculty of judgment is needed for making judgments. The acts of the faculty of judgment is the application of categories. Right, so here's the definition of it. This is on B171, and it's on page 177 in Kemp's notes. If understanding in general is to be viewed as the faculty of rules, judgment will be the faculty of subsuming under rules. Oops, can you see what I'm pointing at? There you go. Judgment will be the faculty of subsuming under rules. That is, of distinguishing whether something does or does not stand under a given rule. 
And then in parentheses in Latin, he says, casus datae legis. Legis. <laughs> I don't know. Legis. <laughs> There's different way. There's so many different ways of pronouncing Latin that I always get confused when I have to read it. All right. Anyway, um, casus datae legis. Um, Right. So this means of a given oops, rule or law. And this means case, right? The, the faculty of judgment, and now you you see what where the judicial metaphor is, is coming in. Oops, I wrote that up on the board. There we go. Casus means case. Cas so casus actually means fall. It's from the verb cadere to fall. Um, but already in Latin, uh, it has um, two other special meanings. One is this legal meaning, a, le a case. Um, and the other is a grammatical meaning. Um, right, so the, grammatically speaking, case, we barely have it in English, but it's like the difference between he and him, right? And when people give their pronouns and they give two pronouns, they're giving both cases. <laughs> okay, this is the uh, nominative case, and this is, I guess, in English, you would call this the objective case or something, right? There's really only two cases. Um, and only for a few words. Um, but in Latin and in German, there's still a more fully developed case system. And this word casus, meaning fall, is used for that too. Um, in that case, it's used for that because of translation from Greek uh, grammarians. I'm not sure about the legal use. Okay, why am I telling you all this? Is it because I love uh, weird facts about words? Well, yes, but <laughs> um, it actually, um, I think, has an application to what's going on here. And I think, you know, it's it's actually because um, why does Kant give the Latin in parentheses at this point in the text? Well, because in German, it's not the case, not the case, that you use one word for all of these things. Actually, um, when you talk about, uh, like, what is the case, um, the German word for it is fall, <laughs> which also means fall. <laughs> um, uh, but that's not the word for grammatical case. Um, uh, so, um, so like you, you wouldn't get all these, and it's not the usual word for a legal case either. So you wouldn't get all these meanings um, if if you just used a German word. And that's I think that's why he goes out of his way to give the Latin here, because um, I think. Uh, both the judicial metaphor and the grammatical metaphor at work here in Kant. So the judicial metaphor, like I said, is, is pretty straightforward. We have a rule, which is like a law. And, you know, again, in the actual case, I mean, when we're actually really thinking about something that that it's, it's an empirical concept, right? It's like the rule that something has to follow to count as cinnabar or to count as a dog or whatever. Um, and we're trying to figure out, um, does the law apply in this case? <laughs> right? So that's the judicial metaphor, but the grammatical metaphor is Right, and so, and I guess I should say one more thing about that. So if you know the, 
if you know the law, but you don't know how to identify the case that falls under the law, then the law is empty. Right? It's no good without the um, capability of applying it to cases. Kant says that if you lack that ability, that is what is properly speaking called stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> the whole footnote about that but in any case um uh but so 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 that's one metaphor but here's the grammatical metaphor suppose you want to judge about an object using a verb you have to know with what case the verb is to be constructed um, right this is the this is constructing the verb or construing the verb with a certain case construing and constructing are the same word really okay so um, now, it's a little hard to explain this in English because we don't, like I said, don't really have cases. <laughs> um, but um, but you can kind of like get a feeling of what it is by like if you if you think about the difference between the words, um, the verbs watch, look, and listen. So to use these verbs properly, you not it's not enough to know the definition of them. Um, you have to know what kind of object they take. Right? So like you can watch X, but you can't look X. You have to look at X. Right? So like just from the definition, strictly speaking, of watch or look. You might not know how to do this. And similarly with listen, you can't listen X or listen at X. You have to listen to X, right? Now, like in a language, more cases like Latin or, or to a lesser extent, German, a lot of times this will come down not to a preposition, but to what case the object is in. Um, and so in a, in, a, in a dictionary, if you pay attention, you'll see that um, that information has to somehow be conveyed along with the definition, right? It will, the, the, the dictionary will have to tell you not only what watch means, but how you supply an object to it. And again, if you know what the verb means, but you don't know how to supply an object to it, then you can't use it. So that's the grammatical metaphor. Um, and I go into that partly because this This verb constructs comes up a lot, or that, that is the German verb construieren, <laughs> which is um, could be translated as construct or construe, depending on the context. And I think we usually say actually to construe a verb with a case. I'm not even sure anymore <laughs> uh, what, what we say in English. But anyway, it's the it's 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 the same word in German, construieren. Um, so I think that uh, that when Kant uses this word, he's usually not thinking of like building something out of like tinker toys or something. He's usually thinking of doing this. <laughs> Okay. Um, what am I putting it together? Okay. 
Okay, so Kant says that formal or general logic doesn't have any rules for the fact for the power of judgment for the faculty of judgment, right? Formal or general logic doesn't tell you how to apply concepts, and you know we should understand that, right? Because formal or general logic, so to speak, forgets about the fact that concepts need to be applied and just asks what they are in themselves. So like um of course it's not going to have anything to say about how to apply them i mean Kant says more than that um about how giving a general rule for applying rules would it's that would itself be a rule and would need another rule to tell you how to apply it um um Somehow that should come to the same thing that I just said about formal logic, but I can't quite see how to make it out. In any case, when it comes to transcendental logic, so remember, transcendental logic is about um, um, our representations in general, not abstracting from the fact that they refer to an object, abstracting from everything else, right? From everything specific about the object. But we're, but but we're asking, you know, how are we in general able to apply our concepts to an object? And so transcendental logic is going to have a lot to say about how to apply concepts. It's going to have to talk about the case that our pure concepts have to be construed with. Um, and what is the case they have to be construed with? Well, it's the case of our form of sensibility, right? So, you know, that's, so again, it's a weird case because we don't know any other possible cases. It's the only case that we know is possible and we only know it's possible because it's actual. But nevertheless, it is a special case, right? So that's why Kant is going to say at the end of the schematism, um, this is the very end of the schematism. The categories, therefore, without schemata are merely functions of the understanding for concepts and represent no object. This meaning they acquire from sensibility, which realizes the understanding in the very process of restricting it. Right, so like our form of sensibility, so like, um, If this is one of the categories, let's like let's say cause and effect. So it's what this is, and this is what Kant calls a function. This is like a general part of the ability of a discursive intellect or understanding to produce empirical concepts. without asking like what form of sensibility goes along with this. So by itself, it represents no object, right? It's, it's like, um, so the judicial metaphor kind of works, but I think the grammatical metaphor is better, right? Like, so, it's like a law, but with no way of applying it to any individual case. Or you can say it's like a verb, but without any rule for how to how it can take an object. Um, 
So our form of sensibility realizes it, gives it an object to refer to. What's the object it's going to refer to? Well, I mean, it's going to be the one that can be synthesized by the imagination in a certain way, namely an event that's preceded by something else in time that determined it to happen. Right, so that's what cause and cause and effect is going to be realized. Now we know what a, an effect is. An effect is an event, and now we know what a cause is. A cause is something that precedes the event that makes it necessary for the event to happen. So our form of sensibility, right, and again, right, like everything I just said involves time, involves our form of sensibility. We don't know what a being, what cause and effect would be to some other being that had some other form of sensibility. Um, but for us, we do know, and we can supply an object to it. So it realizes the category, but at the same time, it restricts it, right? It says, this is the case we apply it to. This is the case we construe it with. Again, I think the grammatical metaphor actually makes more sense than a judicial metaphor. Although I think, again, Kant is using both. Okay, so let me give a more detailed example in the case of the category of quantity. Um, so quantity, I mean, Um, Kant hasn't given an abstract definition of quantity. He does much later on. Um, he doesn't for most of the categories, right? And he even says why he's not going to, but he lets slip a few of them, like for substance and accident and for quantity later on. So like, um, What Kant says later on is that the concept of category of quantity in general is same as many together. <laughs> um, this, this is actually uh, Christian Wolff's definition of totem or whole. Um, and so, I mean, I think you can see, like, this is the, this is strictly speaking is the definition of the third moment of quantity, that is the moment of totality. But the moment of totality, remember, the third moment is a combination of the first two. So the moment of totality, so to speak, sums up what quantity is. So uh, is when you're talking about a quantity, you're talking about somehow, um, something being the same as many different things together. And if you remember back to the metaphysical deduction, why do we, why is this part of the formation of any empirical concept? Well, because like for, a, for universal particular and singular judgments, we need to be able to represent so, for example, we need to be able to represent um, cinnabar as the same as all the cinnabar, <laughs> right? In order to be able to say all cinnabar is red. This all cinnabar here. Um, this is the, this is the, 
this is where we're using unity, the first moment of quantity. We're just, we're using the sameness here, <laughs> right? All cinnabars red means we're taking all cinnabars the same and applying the concept of red to it. And similarly, so for, for, for the particular judgment, like some cinnabar is shiny, we're taking all cinnabars, all different. That's the many. Right, so this is the same. Uh, some cinnabar is shiny is the many, right? Because in order to say some, we have to consider it as different from itself. And then this cinnabar weighs five grams is the same as many together. So that's the function, right? That's the ability of the understanding, the specific ability uh, that's that we're focusing in on that's part of the ability to form empirical concepts. Um, it's the, the function is the ability to represent something as the same as many together. But what is it that makes that possible? So the schema of the category of quantity, Kant says, is number. So what does this have to do with the form of inner sense and imagination and all that other stuff I was drawing? Well, so the way he's thinking of number here is that um, number is plurality measured by a unit. That's a traditional Aristotelian definition of number action. Number is plurality measured by a unit. Measured by a unit means that like, put the units and then I put it again and then I put it again and then I put it again until I get up to the plurality I'm trying to measure. So like this is um, this is a type of synthesis the imagination is able to do. The imagination is able like why why is the imagination necessary to do this because remember so the imagination is the ability to represent things even without their presence now as you go from one unit to the next you have to keep track of the ones that already passed right you have to like keep them around even while you're focusing on the new one that's what the imagination does Right, so like the ability to count something as the same as many together, right? And you know, notice what kind of predicate we get here in the singular judgment. I mean, I guess you could say, well, you chose that. That's not fair, which is true, but <laughs> I chose it because it is it, it's the kind of predicate weighs five grams that turns up specifically in a singular judgment. Um. So, right, like our ability to represent something as the same as many together is the ability, is the ability to like um, take those many and apply the same unit to them over and over again. And we can only do that because of the imagination's ability to synthesize that way. But the imagination's ability to synthesize that way is in turn based on a feature of time as the form of inner sense. Namely, the successiveness of time. 
right? The, like the fact that one time, all, like after one time, there's always another time and they're all the same. <laughs> um, um, so like, um, by the way, I, I wish I could, I wish I could explain better. Um, so like, it's not just a coincidence that time happens to have this feature that enables us to represent things in time using the category of quantity. Um, right, like it must have that feature. Um, does that mean we know something general about forms of sensible intuition? They all have to have a feature like this? I mean, I think Kant wants to say, no, that, you, I mean, that like, that all we know about that feature is contained in this empty function. We can't really say, um, so we can't say that like whatever they, whatever ability they had to represent the same as many together would have to have this kind of successiveness to it, for example. Like we again, like we don't know that successiveness is possible except because it's actual in time. I noticed there's been uh, there's been things in the chat that I never responded to a long time ago. Oops. Oh, someone asked, good question. How would the highest principle of analytic judgment work for the conception of judgments as knowledge on a condition? Well. Um, I mean, it's in some sense, it's kind of trivial, but maybe, right? It's that an analytic judgment is one where the condition itself already implies the rule. So uh, again, if you negate it, you get a contradiction. That makes it sound like it's barely different from the other formulation, though. I think, but... I mean, anyway, that's the best I can do. Um, oh, and Terry said, would each individual intu intuitive intellect have different principles? Would How do you count intuitive intellects? We just said that number is the schema of the category of quantity. Meaning that a uh, number applies to the objects of our sensibility. So when we try to count things that are not possible objects of experience, um, um, it's beyond just empty. Right, it's applying this schema in a case where it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think you know the answer is that that we don't we don't. Like if you asked, could there be more than one intuitive intellect or is there a maximum of one intuitive intellect? Which is which is a good question, right? If you think an intuitive intellect, remember like the only way we usually can think of an intuitive intellect is, is of a, a intellectus archetypus, an intellect like uh, an intellect that creates its objects. Can there be more than one of those? Well, I, you know, good theological question, right? <laughs> Except Kant says, will say, for theoretical purposes, it's not a good question. We don't know what we're asking. Um, and so then, yeah, we don't, we don't know how to count them or their principles or anything like that <laughs> is the answer.
Yeah, I, yeah, Terry says it was in the context of a much earlier discussion. I know, and I, so it's not fair that I'm only responding to it now, but uh, but it's good that I'm responding to it now because now you see like exactly, you know, how much this is actually supposed to rule out, like how much the bad metaphysics includes. <laughs> yeah, there's all these things we can think without contradiction, but as soon as we try to do anything with them, we get in trouble. And that, like, we'll see that in the transcendental dialectic. Um, so, and like, you know, the um, the principle that's going to follow from this is that every object of experience must be made up of units. That is, must be measurable in units. Right. That's we're not going to read that, but it's the axioms of intuition. So the the well, remember I said how the mathematical categories usually you get just quantity, quality, and then when you get to the dynamical categories, that is relation and modality, they're split into the three parts. So. Um, in the case of the analytic of principles, it's even weirder because the titles of all four sections are plural. Axioms of intuition, anticipations of perception, analogies of experience, and postulates of empirical thought in general. But in the first two, there's really only one principle. So it's called the axioms of intuition, but there's only one principle. Anyway, so but the, that so the the principle of the axioms of intuition is going to be that everything is an extensive quantity, meaning that everything can be like built up out of parts that measure it, basically. Um, um, Okay, so that's like that's going through kind of the whole process with the category of quantity. Um, as usual, the the first example is the easiest, and like the le the rest, you know, oh, and the rest are are trivial, is completely false. The rest are much harder to understand. Mm -hmm. But I don't have time because I I still want to go on to say something about schemata in general. Um, because the schematism starts, and. This is really, among many other things, is really confusing. With this thing about how concepts must be homogeneous with their objects. In all subsumptions of an object under a concept, the representation of the object must be homogeneous with the concept. In other words, the concept must contain something which is represented in the object that is to be subsumed under it. Now, I mean, number one, it's a little bit hard to understand what the requirement here is. But number two, uh, it's weird because it seems to lead to the conclusion that a category that is a pure concept of um, the understanding needs something to mediate between it and its object. And that's going to that's the schema. But on the other hand, it seems like we're going to say, but in the case of empirical concepts, which are homogeneous with their objects, we don't need that. But in fact, that's not true, right? Because Kant goes on to discuss the schemata of, right? The plural of schema is schemata. So the schemata of mathematical and empirical concepts. Um, and in fact, he says, like, uh, in a sense, it's much clearer that a concept like the concept dog, that's his example, um, doesn't apply directly to sensible images, but only to a procedure of the imagination in synthesizing them. So, like, why is that so obvious? Well, I mean, when you think about it, uh, um, 
I mean, I guess there's two things. Um, the one Kant emphasizes is um, that uh, we never perceive a complete case of a dog. I mean, that's true for a number of reasons. Like, first of all, you don't see, like, you don't see the inside of the dog, hopefully, <laughs> right? You don't see the other side of the dog. You only see the side that's facing you. But more than that, like, different dogs have contradictory properties that the no one dog could have all of them, right? That's, I mean, that's even clearer in the case of triangle which we're going to see more about in 100C soon, right? But where Locke says that the abstract idea of triangle is a difficult thing because it, um, it must be neither uh, isosceles nor scaling on. It must be neither, right? Like there's all these different kind of triangles and they're all triangles, but no one triangle can be all the different kinds. Um, so, like, for both those reasons, um, whenever we perceive a dog, we don't perceive everything that corresponds in, an, in a possible object to the concept dog. We only perceive a little bit of it, so to speak. Um, and so the imagine, what the imagination does is supply the missing parts <laughs> from our memory from the experience which by which we originally acquired the concept dog um, and there, there, thereby allows us to compare our limited um, image to the full rule of the concept. I think, I mean, although Kant doesn't emphasize this as much, I think it's also the case that whenever you perceive a dog, you perceive all kinds of other irrelevant stuff. And the imagination has to have a procedure for ignoring that, right? So the schema of the concept dog is a way the imagination has, so to speak, of going through an image and collecting it together and leaving out parts that don't belong and supplying parts that aren't there. Um, and after going through all that procedure, then you can compare it to the concept. So this is the synthesis and this is the synthetic unity of the understanding. This is the concept dog. This is like image of a dog. And uh, as Kant puts it, the, the, the imagination produces the, I mean, maybe I shouldn't call this image of a dog, like sensations of a dog. The imagination produces it as an image of the concept is the way he's, he, at least in some places, says it. Right, it becomes an image of the concept because the imagination has a way of going through it to show it as corresponding to the concept. Um, and he says, like, the same thing is true of mathematical concepts. So first he talks about these five dots, right, and says these five dots are an image, or maybe you should say can be produced as an image of the number five, right? That is, the imagination has a procedure for going through these dots and um, 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 holding them together in a way that corresponds to the number five. holding them together one after the other. So it's, you know, um, it involves going through them successively and remembering the ones you've already been through and so forth. And Kant says, you know, uh, the, the concept five, the concept of the number five, strictly speaking, refers immediately to that synthesis of the imagination, the schema, and only indirectly to this thing here, these five dots, or this image of five dots. 
And he says, you can see that even more clearly if you take the number 1000, right? Or he could be talking about a Kiliagon, as Descartes example. So like in the case of the number 1000, um, like we never look at a bunch of dots and say, oh, a thousand dots. <laughs> But that's not how we apply the concept 1000. We apply the concept 1000, we have a very complicated procedure. Um, you know, I mean, and complicated meaning there's many different ways of doing it, right? Like you have to know kind of all of them to, to fully know how to use that concept, right? Like arranging things in a cube that's 10 by 10 by 10, and, you know, it's like one way of doing it or counting them off by hundreds, right? Using hundred as a unit. Um, uh, like those are all parts of ways we supply something as an image of the concept 1000. Um, so what's the difference if mathematical concepts and empirical concepts, and if it's, I think it's important like to keep this in mind going forward, that mathematical concepts and empirical concepts also require a schema, right? They also can't be applied. That is, the uh, faculty of judgment can't do what it needs to do with them, apply them to a case without the help of the imagination. What's the difference between those and the pure intellectual concepts, that is the categories? that makes us say that the categories are not homogeneous with their objects. And like, I think, although I don't know how to fit this to the text very well, I must admit, but I think that same thing I drew before kind of explains this, right? So here's the category. Well, so let's say here's the concept dog. And um, so the concept dog was formed from our experience of dogs, meaning not just by sensing one dog after another, but by synthesizing it, right? Like learning to associate certain things with each other, for example. That's, that is the imagination, the formation of the schema, so to speak, precedes the formation of the concept and makes it possible. That's the empirical deduction of the concept dog would be to go back and explain the schema, basically. So the schema of the imagination in this case exactly corresponds to the content of the concept. If I were to say like, okay, what if there's a kind of dog that doesn't in any way affect our senses the way a dog would. <laughs> it's the kind of dog that doesn't look like a dog, it doesn't feel like a dog, it doesn't smell like a dog, right? Um, uh, doesn't have any of the indirect sensible effects of dogs. Um, uh, that wouldn't make any sense, right? Dog is an empirical concept. It applies to a certain kind of thing we're experienced. There can't be a dog that can't be experienced as a dog. So I think I think this is the homogeneity between the concept and its object. That its object, and it's like so to speak, its immediate object is the schema rather than the the object out here that we're referring to. This, you know, the the this, this schema exactly matches the concept. Whereas in the case of the category, the schema restricts the concept. Because, because the category wasn't acquired from experience. This is like all possible experience, the, the entire form of our sensibility, all of space and time, right? Um, uh, but the, the category wasn't acquired from that. It's an a priori concept. So now the schema, although th there's a schema here and there's a schema here, specifying the schema here is um, 
some sense trivial. It's something you must have known with, in order to, to know how to use the concept at all. Where specifying the schema here is not at all trivial. It means realizing the category and restricting it. Okay, that's all I have time to say. And I will see you tomorrow <laughs> on Zoom. Um, and then hopefully next week in person. Um, okay, and thank you to everyone for coming. Bye.